Hello everybody and welcome back to Austin, Texas for South by Southwest. We are lounging quite uh, lazily here on the lawn across the river from downtown Austin. Uh, we saw a bunch of movies this weekend, so many that they literally killed crews just now. Let's just start talking about the movies that we saw. First up, uh, I'm just thinking chronologically here. We went to go see Manglehorn. Manglehorn was uh, David Gordon Green's new film with Al Pacino. Uh, what's his name from the Mindy Project? Holly Hunter was there. Holly Hunter was there. I forgot about Holly. Yeah, Holly Hunter was in it. Um, so Manglehorn is about Al Pacino, who is playing this the aging, lonely, sort of bitter guy who's a locksmith. Um, and uh, Cruz, what'd you think of it? Um, David Gordon Green's career confuses me. It does a little. And this movie confuses me. Um, in the sense that, like, I think that Al Pacino's performance is worth, makes it worth watching this movie. There are some scenes, there's like two or three scenes in it that, like, really affected me. And as a whole, his performance is really, really strong. But it kind of falls apart on itself because it continues to lose the like emotional center of the piece like it, it he doesn't go from a to b he just goes a and then like cut three quarters of the way through the movie and then like b he has a giant re he's had a giant revelation all of a at sudden some he's point, a new man and he's a new man and you're like where the fuck did that come from yeah. al like did you take a pill last night i don't know what's going on i mean it did it really struck me as a very personal film. Like I could tell that the film meant a lot to the people who made it, to yeah. the writer and the director, and even Al Pacino. Like I could, I could tell uh, it, it resonated with me in in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just didn't think there was a whole lot of takeaway from the film other than Al Pacino's yeah. performance. Because there, and I, it, this is this is not a spoiler, uh, but there's a chance Al Pacino might have been magical. Yes, <laughs> and that's and that's just part of the confusion of this movie. There is, is, you know, it goes from one spot to another, and you hear all these stories about, uh, you know, what Al Pacino did back in the day, and like, oh yeah, he really had a positive impact on me when I was a kid, and this is here's this crazy story about him bringing a dog back to life, that may or may not be true, and then also the way it's cut together kind of implies that it is true, and that there's something supernatural going on, but we don't talk about it. Yeah, no. It so it's it's very. It's it's very confused, uh, you know, tonally. I think too, which is which is kind of a kind of an issue. But I would have liked to see the Al Pacino is magic movie. I would have loved that. Yeah, if it's Al Pacino is magic and he and he starts a new relationship with Holly Hunter, if that's the movie, I'm in. Then it's I'm gonna in. be great. You, so if you're a really 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 big Al Pacino fan, you're gonna love it. You're gonna you're gonna love it. Like my, I think my dad would love this movie. After, but he'd also fall asleep halfway through and then have to watch the second half later. There was a woman in, in, so. in line for the next movie that asked me, he's like, did you ever see Sin of a Woman? I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, I saw a Sin, yeah. It's like, isn't Al Pacino good? <laughs> <laughs> that was the Agreed. <laughs> that was the takeaway was... of, of Manglehorn is, do you remember Sin of a Woman? Um, okay, so that's Manglehorn, David Gordon Green's latest film. Um, Mackenzie, what, what was the first one that you saw this weekend? Hello, my name is Doris. Yes. yes. I think my favorite movie of the festival so far, I'm sure a lot of people are going to say that. It's incredible. I think I'm Doris. She's like this sad old cat lady. But <laughs> it's like my biggest fear in life is that I'm going to... I came out and I was like, I'm Doris! Yeah. They made a lot of fun of me. But um, I think it's incredible. It's such a humanist story. You really feel for the characters. It's, I mean, you get Schmidt, Max Greenfield, and you're like, oh my God, it's Schmidt actually playing a real character, and you completely divorce yourself from his character on New Girl, which I watch religiously. So yeah, he's, sure. he's very much the romantic lead. In, yeah, in movie, I was really is... sure that I was not going to be able to divorce myself from Schmidt. Um, and I also sat really close to him, so that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's oh my God, it's By Schmidt. myself, I was a weird, creepy fangirl. No, but it, it literally was the most delightful thing I've sat in front of in a long time. And that's the best way I can think to describe it. It is delightful. Um, Doris is a, is a very unique character. She's, she's uh, 60 something. Her mother has just passed away. She's kind of a recluse and it's about her opening herself back up to, to being alive again. It's funny um, because right when we were going to watch this movie, I talked about how I really love, I don't love midlife crisis movies. I love coming of age stories that happen to people in the middle of their life. 
and that's what this is. Yeah. It's Sally Field playing, per, first of all, doing one of the best performances of her life ever. She's committed to this character 100%, completely fearless, and it's really, really, really beautiful to watch and really awkward and funny and amazing, and it makes you want to, like, go outside and go to a concert and dance to electronic music and wear weird shit and eat weird shit and meet people and fall in love and, like, dance in the rain. And, like, I have no soul, and this movie is made... I'm thinking about it, and I just want to, like, throw this microphone away Way and go dance. It's like life affirming mm -hmm. in a lot of kind ways. Of like it just felt days so summer, good. Actually. And there are so many traps that a film like that can fall into. You talk about coming of age stories and midlife crisis stories, and there were so many moments in the movie where I'm like, oh man, I I, I hope like she she goes to a concert at at one point and she's wearing something a little ridiculous <laughs> and it's like, oh man, I hope she doesn't stand out, and then she doesn't, and you're yeah. like, oh thank God, <laughs> like right, because there's so, there's so many times in this movie where it could have fell in, fallen into sort of schmaltzy kind of well-worn territory stuff that you'd expect but and, and I and I got to speak with Michael Showalter uh, yesterday as well actually that interview will be up later in the week um, but uh, or it'll be up right now I'm not sure but I got to speak with Michael Showalter and, and he, he just in talking about his approach to the character he um, like he really enjoyed having such a unique character and like a unique way in you know and so that allowed for comedy that you know you don't really expect it has something really like meaningful and cool to say. And up and down throughout the whole movie. There were there were moments in where people were just rolling in the theater, just laughing. And then there were moments where the air just went out of the room completely. Yeah. Like because they were so so sad. Like there was there's a some genuinely incredible moments from Sally Field that, that just break you in half. Um, Mackenzie they, cried. I, I was crying everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they break you in half and then immediately pull you back out of it to do something humorous and that kind of dichotomy of life of Yes, you can you can have something horrible happen, but you have to keep going and figure it out. And and something funny is going to come along immediately afterwards. Yeah. And so it doesn't ever leave you in one place for, for too long. And Showalter had some very interesting things to say about that in our interview, <laughs> which you can see right here. <laughs> Click. <laughs> so so yeah, hello, my name is Doris. Was, could not recommend it more highly. If you're a fan of romantic comedies, if you're a fan of uh, you know Michael Showalter's work, go, going all the way back to the state. I'm a silly fanboy. And if you're a fan of feeling good about yourself while credits roll, uh, <laughs> you're gonna love this one. And the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we actually, it was, it was a triple feature. We just kind of camped out in a theater uh, that day. The third movie that we saw on Saturday was Ex Machina, which is the latest from Alex Garland. Uh, he wrote and directed, this is his feature debut as a director. Uh, he wrote 28 Days Later, wrote Sunshine. Um, so really cool science fiction voice. And it was, uh, I, I really enjoyed the movie. I, I've got a soft spot for science fiction um, and good hard science fiction too. Uh, there was a lot of real science in this and a lot of like speculative science about like where we're gonna be shortly. Uh, right. In terms there was of a lot of, uh, of believable speculative spe speculative right. science. Right. Uh, Alex Garland uh, took a took a small dig at Interstellar at the end of the movie when he's like, "Ah, oh, we're never gonna have a world that's not gonna show up next to Mars, right?" Um, <laughs> But uh, it's like, I hate to disappoint you guys, but there's not going to be a wormhole <laughs> next to Saturn, so we're, we're not going to. But yeah, in terms of my favorite movies that we saw this weekend, I think it's to me it's a tie between Hello, My Name Is Doris and Ex Machina because I don't think you can compare the two. You know, one of them is a, a life affirming comedy, and the other one is a a thoughtful intellectual science fiction piece, and it's very contained. It only has three characters really. Um, the guy from Harry Potter. Domhnall Gleeson. Uh, the guy from A Most Violent Year. Oscar Isaac. Both of them are in Star Wars. And then some really hot chick. I'm, I don't remember her name. Me neither. She was very good as the robot. She was amazing. I'm, I asked Bill Irwin the same thing about TARS earlier as well, about like striking that balance between like a robot and then also having a great deal of humanity and and it was another really impressive example of um of doing just just that like i thought she, i thought her performance was great alicia vikander there you go uh yeah alicia vikander it's it's also i think i have a hard time remember her name because i think of her as ava the robot right because because i don't you know because like i don't i've not i, I haven't seen her work before uh, or I, I don't remember having seen her work. She's, a, by the way, amazing. I yeah. hope Alicia Vikander is now... This movie makes her super popular uh, because I think she is 
a really, really, really talented person. Yeah. Um, but it's it's lit- it's just about um, what's it? Oscar Isaac getting Dominic Gleeson to come to his secluded mountain rich guy home. He's like the Bill Gates uh, of of the of the universe they've created. He created Google, basically, like the biggest, giantest search engine in the world. And uh, he's now the super richest guy in the world. And he's, but he's super fascinated with moving technology forward. And he's created uh, a robot. Um, and he wants to do the Turing test to see if she is viable AI, if she really is. Uh, an artificial intel, an independent artificial intelligence, and she's just not mimicking programmed emotions and thoughts. And so he gets Dominic Gleeson to come in and and like sit with her every day and talk to her and Turing test her. And the and the movie is a series of tests. The characters test each other. The movie tests you. It, it tests your questions about reality and what is consciousness and what who the heroes are, what the story's about. How it's laid out, it, it's just even it, like what your expectations are about movies. Yeah, like it's it's a really interesting. It's and the way Alex Garland describes it, he's like it's a big idea movie. Like it's a movie about big ideas, and it's designed to get you to talk about those big ideas. For and Cruz and I, Cruz and I, after the screening, hours, a couple hours, we talked about it, talking like, about this movie. Yeah, and I don't like talking to Cruz, <laughs> so it's a really good movie, and. Uh, and what I find fascinating is that, like, recently, um, the the most recent sci-fi movie that I've seen is probably Chappie, and one of the constant complaints about Neil Blomkamp, which I agree with, is that his movies sort of falter under the weight of his ideas. He has 25 different ideas that he's trying to address, and he, he does so too on the nose and, and sacrifices the narrative to do so. Uh, Alex Garland is the master of this at this point like the he's done it before i mean like i think sunshine kind of fell under the weight of its ideas a little bit but 28 days later holds up really really strongly in terms of of maintaining a a, a narrative and strong characters in a world and presenting questions and this one i think knocks it out of the park and we got to talk to alex garland as well uh yesterday so it was yeah he's got a lot of really interesting (laughs) things to say about you know exposition and sci-fi and sci-fi in general and and how to how to get ideas across uh you know specifically in that genre he had some really interesting things to say about that uh so check that out as well but ex machina is going to be in theaters very soon yeah april April, 10th i think think, is when it comes out so uh so you'll all get to see that very soon and and i think everybody's gonna gonna it has the feeling of uh it has the feeling of like Looper, yes. kind of one one of these uh, sort of speculative science fiction, but still believable in lower budget, smaller in scope kind of kind of films that uh, that is really gonna gonna strike a chord with a lot of people. I think. Yeah, I think to th- like be careful in, in terms of like if you want like an action packed sci fi movie, this movie has no action in it. This right. movie is three characters talking to each other, and that's. I'm, there are other things that happen that are really, really interesting and really, really fun, and I'm not going to ruin them for you. Uh, but it's it's like watching a play, but right. it's a really well performed and interesting play. So don't go if you want like blunderbusses shooting like time travelers, but just go see this movie. Take like it's a Super little bit slow, movie. but go see this yeah. movie. So there you go, Ex Machina, Mackenzie. What else did we see this weekend? Um, I saw. What did I see? I saw Adult Beginners with Rose Byrne, and it was written, produced, and stars Nick Kroll. It's a coming. It's like a late in life coming of age story again, where you, they think they have it all together, and then life events occur, and all of a sudden, it's I've got to move back in with my sister, and I've got to figure out like start my life over. I was really excited for this movie. The trailer looks great. The the everything that you hear about it looks great. I love Rose Byrne, Nick Kroll. Carrie's hilarious. Hilarious. He's, I mean, really great in the film. He carries it really well. It just kind of falls short. Honestly, like, if I could take the movie and re-edit it, I think that the elements were there. It just, the pacing is slow. It needs just a little bit better direction. It's a first-time feature film director, and it kind of shows. I, I hate to say that. I mean, we're looking at all these movies like Obvious Child and Skeleton Twins and, and movies in this genre that are really popular right now and I was thinking it was going to be along those lines and I just think 
the performances were great, but they weren't given a lot to work with. And it's kind of a letdown. I know you guys are going to see it next week. What yeah. are your expectations going into it? Well, I, I mean, I think I think Kroll is 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 very funny. Nick Kroll's got a, a, a really funny voice, um, <laughs> you know. In and, and, and I, I love him in everything. Voice. He's got he's <laughs> legitimately got a yeah. funny voice. Um, but like his his show on Comedy Central is pretty funny, yeah. and um, you know, I, a f- first time filmmaking is is kind of a category unto itself a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um, because you gotta, you gotta get the first one out of your system. Like, um, doing... It's a really good first film, but it feels like I'm at a film festival watching a film festival movie, which is not, not necessarily what I was expecting, because you're at South South by Southwest and you see all these big studio films and you're comparing them to that. And it's not necessarily a bad thing either, because, you know, and, and picking up with, you know, hopefully, uh... Ideally, with the first-time director, you like you get to become you get to get on on the ground floor with them. You know, like you get to become a fan of of that of of that writer, that director, whoever it is. Um, And then when their next movie comes out, you can see the growth or not. You know, so I mean, first-time directors are 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 honestly a lot of fun to watch. Like the movie might be a little disappointing in the short term, but it's a really interesting. If you're you know really into film, like it's an interesting thing to watch. It's a really dangerous thing to do to make your first film, which is why it's so exciting. But like a lot of times, some of the directors we think of as great, if you look at their first film, you can see sort of the potential, but it's not that great a, a movie. Right. But then there's other people who, who blow right out of the gate with like the most amazing piece of art that you've ever seen. And then they never And then it make turns out that was that the only good idea it. they ever had. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, so uh, Rose Byrne, so we found out that Rose Byrne is dating Bobby Cannavale. Is that how you say his name? In real life, IRL? Yes. In real life, she got him into the movie, and then the next movie that I saw right after that was Spy with Rose Byrne and Bobby Cannavale. Um, she Twist. was so much better in Spy. <laughs> Spy was actually surprisingly really good. I was not expecting it. I mean, we've got a lot of... I don't want to say bad Melissa McCarthy movies, but... No, I, I think it's fair to say we've had some bad Melissa McCarthy yeah. movies. <laughs> Melissa well, McCarthy's hilarious. She's been hilarious she in some bad is movies. She's hilarious in this movie. It starts out with the kitschy, like, oh, we're going to put her undercover as the cat lady, or we're going to put her undercover as this other unattractive woman. And then all of a sudden she sheds her, I'm going to be frumpy exterior and becomes totally badass. The All of a sudden, I feel like a different screenwriter came in halfway <laughs> through and it becomes amazing because I'm like, okay. It was guys. one of those like continue stories. Uh-huh. Like they just passed it around. And, and then everybody it got wrote, real good. Everybody wrote run, one paragraph and I then just passed it to the next person. I think that might have been what happened. Because <laughs> all of a sudden, now I just want to sit, go back and read the screenplay because you are laughing at one joke so hard that you can't even hear the next joke. It's so, so, so fast. Jason Statham is hilarious. He plays this. Wait, r- Jason Statham is hilarious? He's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. What? I believe it. He plays like a rogue CIA agent who quits, but like decides he's going to just go in and help. And he messes up everything the whole time. And he just is the, he's like a Russell Brand kind of character. It's incredible. You're yeah. not expecting that from him at all. I think yeah. it's better than he, yeah, it's the same director, um, actress combination. I think that the writing really sells this film. Go into it like really ready to, to listen to some awesome jokes. It's so cool. funny. Um, Bobby Cannavale, amazing. He plays a bad guy with like serious eyeliner. I think he's got a Russell Brand thing going now that I'm thinking about this. For sure, that's where he's going in life. So Bobby yeah. Cannavale, I think, <laughs> it has to be high in the running for most underrated dude. He's so cool. I love him in everything. Yeah, I hope he doesn't have a Russell Brand. I don't hope he's not going <laughs> yeah, in a Russell rooting, Brand direction. <laughs> actively life, rooting against that. That, that um, sounds like a disaster. Kind of hilarious. So Spy, Spy is coming out everywhere yeah. soon. Go um, see the second half of the movie. <laughs> yeah, you can be late to Spy. Yeah. The other, the other big comedy that is uh, is going to be coming out everywhere soon that we got a chance to see. Um, it was actually a work in progress. Uh, and they're halfway through cutting the the film. Is uh, Trainwreck, uh, Judd Apatow's uh, next movie, Trainwreck, uh, showed a work in progress cut. Um, and it's so cool too. I yeah, which I thought was a really interesting thing to do here. I thought that was way more fun than showing Spy. Yeah. Well, it was, <laughs> um, it was a rough cut. It wasn't finished. <laughs> but. Um, but Trainwreck was now Judd Apatow. I feel like has has been missing for a little while. Like he ran out of autobiographical material. I think uh, for you know this is forty and funny people and um, those I did not those, like those movies. Yeah, I didn't I didn't care for those movies. 
Um, but Trainwreck, Amy Schumer wrote the script uh, and is starring in it, and and she carries the movie. Like Amy Schumer is very very good. The movie it's it's clearly a work in progress. It's it's you know, and I mean you could argue that all of Judd Apatow's movies are thirty minutes too long. Um, but this movie, there's there's plenty of fat to trim in this movie. There's some there's some kind of bizarre pacing issues. I was really interested, and I'm going to be interested to see this in the theater to see if they if they tweak this at all because there were a lot of laughs that covered up the next joke, um, and I'm wondering how much of that they were paying attention to uh, in the screening um, because there were there were again it was, it was sort of like you said with spy. I mean it was joke 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 joke, um, and you know like. There were three jokes in a row. We laughed at the first one, missed the second one, came back in time for the third one, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> so I think if you just pull out a bunch of second jokes in all of these in in all these situations, the movie is probably going to be 25 minutes shorter. Um, but it was it was very funny. I think that in a lot of ways this is going to be a return to what we loved about Judd Apatow uh, in the first place, with uh, you know Knocked Up and Forty Year Old Virgin. And What's it about? The movie's about Amy Schumer, um, and it, it, you know knowing her stand up comedy, it feels like the movie is about Amy Schumer. She's uh, she's a woman who who is a train wreck in a lot of ways. She she drinks way too much. She smokes a lot of pot. She sleeps with all the guys. Um, all of them. Yeah. And uh, and it's just a, and you know it's about her uh, sort of outlook on life and how it it changes and maybe it should change, maybe it shouldn't, maybe it's good for her. And so there's a lot of it's 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 a very um, you know it's a very interesting look at a character because it, it it's non-judgmental. It really felt like it wasn't a statement about this lifestyle more than it was this character made this decision because it's right for her. But I, I mean, outside of that, it's a it's a very standard romantic comedy in its in its structure. Um, is it like Bill Hader yeah. is hilarious? Um, Amy Schumer, I think, is is funny. All of the cameos, cause like John Cena, is in it for a little bit. <laughs> He's <laughs> hilarious, and LeBron James is in it. He's, he has legitimate laughs. We get legitimate laughs from LeBron James in this movie, which is like, you know, look across, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, Shaquille O'Neal showing up in an Adam Sandler movie is like the most painful thing to watch <laughs> of all time. <laughs> but they, they really pull it off uh, in this movie, which I was really impressed with. It is a work in progress. I'm curious to see what they what they do between now and its release date. But it was funny. I think I think a, a lot of the headlines on this movie are going to be that, that we, can, we can all like Judd Apatow again. What else did you see yesterday? I saw you saw um, seven... Brothers. Oh, seven Chinese, seven Chinese brothers. brothers. Let me just look at it. Real. Yeah, and it wouldn't be a film festival without Jason Schwartzman. Yeah. It really would not be it a festival. It would not be a film Jason. festival. So, <laughs> Mackenzie, you you got to see uh, Seven Chinese Brothers. Yeah, Seven Chinese Brothers, a super misleading title. It's a it comes from a song. There's nothing to do with Seven Chinese Brothers at all. Are there but, any Chinese people in this movie no, at all? Not, right, it's I'm Jason out. Schwartzman. I was, it's not about Jason Schwartzman having seven Chinese brothers. <laughs> I'm out. He has a really cute dog. Seriously. Is the dog it's named Seven good. Chinese Brothers? No, the dog okay. is actually Jason Schwartzman's dog in real life. This is the best part of the movie. There's a lot of just following this like super chubby, like giant pug s dog going for like the entire movie. That's the highlight of the movie, guys. <laughs> okay. I, when you see I the movie, feel like that's a review <laughs> in and of itself. The best part was following this pug dog. The movie is basically just <laughs> following a dog on Instagram. It gets washed. It gets, no, it's moving. It does things. You hear its noises. Um, yeah, so it's Jason Schwartzman's dog, which was apparently super cool uh, to work with. And, and all the cats were like, dog's amazing. But no, so it's a story about Jason Schwartzman. He's finding himself in life. I mean, I see, I don't know, maybe I'm just like, I just go, I see Jason Schwartzman and I see Rushmore. There are a lot of like long tracking shots of your, the beginning of it. You're like, yes, Rushmore too. But then he's like completely the opposite of his character in Rushmore. He's just like, doesn't real ha really have any drive in life. The the opening is him getting fired from Buca de Beppo's for drinking all the alcohol. <laughs> and like, it's just like, okay, this is who this Been there, is. Been there, man. Yeah, totally. Sunday Adepembe plays uh, Jason Schwartzman's best friend, and he's working in the nursing home taking care of his grandmother. And it's just a really cute story of grandmother losing her life and teaching Jason Schwartzman not to waste his. And it's not like, go out and like, start a Fortune 500 company. It's just like have ambition, have drive, and and stand for something in life. And it's just a really cute story of saying you don't have to go out and, and be a really big deal. Just live your life and have a purpose. And it's it's a fun indie film. I mean, it really follows the 
very much, nothing really happens in the film. He gets a job, he gets another job, he finds himself. He it's Jason about. Schwartzman at a film festival. Yeah, it's real good. <laughs> it's, it's Jason Schwartzman at a film festival. I still up. don't know what this movie's about. <laughs> yeah. I still That's have it. no idea. I told you what it's about. He's no, I got it. <laughs> Jason Schwartzman hangs out with his dog. And grandma. And, and grandma. Tindana Pembe, and Tindana Pembe. Pembe. Dude ever from TV on the radio. That's it. They All walk right. around, cool shots. Tindana Pembe. <laughs> Jason Schwartzman and his grandma and his dog have an Instagram. Turn it's it pretty into much like a moving Instagram. It's a super indie film. I don't <laughs> so want it'll probably terrible. end up on Netflix at some point. And you might watch it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> There's Maybe. a chance <laughs> yeah. you will accidentally watch this movie at some point in your life. Uh-huh. Mackenzie's <laughs> recommendation is not do not do or, not do or don't watch this movie, but, <laughs> but it, might, you it, might, might, it might happen to you. You might wind up watching this movie. <laughs> like a cold. It <laughs> might just happen to you. <laughs> And so the uh, the last movie that we got to see this weekend, it was a midnight screening, Cruz and I got to go to, uh, of The Nightmare. Uh, the Nightmare I was really, really interested to see because it's it's uh, the next film by a guy named Randy Asher who did Room 237, which Room 237 um, was, I thought, a super interesting documentary. Um, it's about The Shining and all the different theories about the meaning behind The Shining. And I thought it was a really creative uh, way to do a documentary that I hadn't really seen before. And so... And, and I heard about the nightmare. Uh, it was actually playing at Sundance, but we missed it at Sundance. Uh, and they were referring to it as a horror documentary. And that's why I got and, excited. And, yeah, well, and I didn't know really anything else about it other than like, okay, that I, I liked his last movie. A horror documentary sounds fascinating. I gotta go. Um, and I, I'm not. I love horror movies, and I don't get very easily scared. So the concept of like having a movie that's real, that's supposed to freak me the fuck out. I'm in. Yeah. So the movie, uh, the documentary is about um, a real life phenomenon called sleep paralysis that has been affecting us for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. There are Renaissance paintings depicting. There seem um, to be like old Chinese stories yeah. and monsters. It's, and it's where the it's where the word nightmare actually came from. Right. Uh, they the show they show the etymology of the word nightmare at the very beginning of the of the film to to reiterate that, but. Um, but what happens is like you wake up sort of it's like you a lucid dream up. where you're paralyzed and then like weird shadow people come into the room and like terrorize you right is and more or less what it is and the images that people have seen through history seem to be unrelated to culture because people have seen the same thing all around the world for yeah. hundreds of years and it's either like a cat sitting on your chest or a guy with red eyes or the shadow people or a dude with a, a hat a man with a hat a man with a hat is a, which, it, it's been consistent around the world for hundreds of which years which is really weird and he looks like Freddy Krueger kind of yeah which, which is, is probably the, where Freddy Krueger came from it, it, yeah it, it was there was a, an instance um, in like Thailand or something where hundreds of people started dying in their sleep and that was the inspiration for this Freddy Krueger and Nightmare on Elm Street. Movie ever. <laughs> We're just sitting here well, talking about it. But here's the problem. Out. But here's here's where in, and and right up until that, like I'm totally on board. And for the first 20 minutes of this movie, I was like, I might have to leave. Yeah, Clint was gonna quit. Like I might, I almost got up and left. But I'm glad I didn't because the movie kind of disappoints you. Yeah. <laughs> 23 <laughs> like, minutes okay. in. I'm. We're glad we didn't leave. The movie ruins it. And because it, it, I don't think the movie's executed very well, and so it takes out all of the fear and all of the suspense and everything interesting about this subject without really exploring it, explaining it, or delving into it at yeah. all. It's I, I personally think, and I'm sorry, Randy Asher, I personally think this movie was lazily made. Ooh. He interviewed eight people and then wrapped a bunch of, like, overproduced, unnecessary, like creative recreations around them in order to make them interesting or like build it into a horror documentary or a horror movie and it really takes away from the reality that he's presenting it takes away the credibility of these people's stories and it doesn't go in depth it doesn't explore anything it doesn't like he doesn't like go and talk to a doctor and go and talk to a psychologist and go and talk to like a priest or at, something at best you could say that he dips his toes into yeah. it he like presents he, the he pre- reality. yeah he presents the situation you under you have an understanding of like what the experience is and i think that was that was his only goal with the film was to present the experience of uh of sleep paralysis which 
I, I think is an interesting thing, but that's an interesting first part of a right. documentary. Or about it's an interesting travel. like short film. Yeah. Right. Right. And and what's frustrating is that the reason I, I love documentaries and I love documentaries because let's be honest, they do all the work for you. Right? <laughs> like if I want to learn about like the pros and cons of the war on drugs, you know, I'm gonna go watch the house that we live in and it's gonna explain to me where the war on drugs came from, why it's a problem or why it's not a problem and, and the reality of the situation they're in, and it's gonna use real people's stories as uh, you know, as different uh, to, to, to illustrate different points that it's trying to make. Um, this movie just just kind of said, "Hey, this is a thing. Pretty you weird, go do right? the work later. Bye." Um, it's like those restaurants that make you cook the food. One of the producers was there, and he asked everybody to like show a hand. This was the most interesting part of the entire. Show a hands who here has has had sleep paralysis, and like a third of the theater raised their hands, if not more. Yeah, like a ton of people did. And then he asked, and like those the, people, how many of them had seen the shadow figures and the dude with the hat, and like half of them yeah. left their hands up. It was bizarre, and and so then oh, you know yeah. we see that, and then the movie starts, and it's freaky for the first twenty minutes, but then by the end they just keep chipping away at it, and like. I don't take the phenomenon seriously at all. No. So, uh, let us know what you think of all that in the comments down below. If you've seen any of these films already, I know they've been out and about in different parts of the world and different film festivals uh, for a little bit. Um, you know, let us know what you thought of them down in the comments below. But uh, that's uh, that's all for us here from South by Southwest. We got a plane to catch. We'll be back in LA shortly. Uh, thanks for watching. Click like and subscribe.